Well, there's a lot that happens in your brain and your body. Mental health and taking vitamins is such a taboo. I want to be a part of the action that's changing our world and making it better. I'm Richard Gerhart. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhart. You just heard some snippets from our show. We had amazing people on. Listen for the rest of it. Want to protect your business? The time is near. You've given it heart. Now, get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. I'm Richard Gearhart, founder of Gearhart Law, a full-service intellectual property law firm specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I'm Elizabeth Gearhart, not an attorney, but I work at Gearhart Law doing the marketing and I have my own startups. Welcome to Passage to Profit, everyone. The road to entrepreneurship where we talk with startups, small businesses, and discuss the intellectual property that helps them flourish. We have on our show just an amazing guest. I'm so looking forward to speaking with her. She's Sonia Satra, who is actually a famous actress who appeared on Guiding Light and One Life to Live. And now she's entering a new phase where she's a fitness author and a motivator. And we're going to hear all about her new program. And then we have Phil Toussaint, who has Ecopreneur Media, which is a really cool way to help the world so that your grandkids have a place to live. <laughs> so I'm not going to say any more right now. And then we have Mamie Bio and TJ Shaw with Vital IV Infusion. It's amazing. So you want to hear what they have to say. And it's not just infusions. It's Vital IV hey, Infusion. these guys so, are way ahead of so the curve. So they're way ahead of the curve. But before we get to our distinguished guests now, it's time for IP in the News. And we're going to be talking about Katy Perry. And the song that was popular a while ago, it was called Dark Horse. And it really made it to the top of the charts. But guess what? She's getting sued for copyright infringement. And actually, the case got resolved. But it's really interesting because the people who sued her only sued her for like four notes in the song, which I happen to think, even as an intellectual property lawyer, is a little on the outrageous side. Right. They used copyright law. They got an award for $2.8 million, but then it went back to court. Because, you know, once you get a court resolution, it's never resolved. You can keep going back. <laughs> and, and, um, and The, the case that said, never ends. The court said, no, you know, we changed our mind. So they said allowing a copyright over this material would essentially amount to allowing an improper monopoly over two-note pitch sequences or even the minor scale itself. In the article where we learned about this, they talked about an ostinato which I guess is this really short sequence of notes that appeared in the song. I didn't even know what an ostinato was. I had to look it up. And I listened to the Katy Perry song, and I didn't hear any ostinatos because, I mean, it, it was so fast, I guess I just completely missed it. Well, And since we're talking about copyright, I do have to say that we did get this article talking about this from thethings.com, and it was by Astrid Longy, published September 18, 2023. But I also want to say she puts in here... Katie and Orlando Bloom, I guess, get sued a lot. So they were recently sued by a man who claims he sold them their Santa Barbara home while he was medicated. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this could be a a comment for vital IV infusions, but we'll be back to them. And the other part of this, I guess there's now people who are trying to blacklist the song Dark Horse because – made reference to the serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. And so they are down on the song for that reason. So That's pretty gross. I guess the moral of the story is if you're a famous person, you just better plan to get sued for just about anything. Can you imagine Mm. her lawyers? I mean, I'm sure they're keeping very busy. Anyway, it's Richard's Roundtable, and I'd like to ask our distinguished guests what they think about all of this. Sonia, welcome to the show. What's your opinion on all of this copyright infringement? Sounds like people are very (laughs) sue-crazy. I mean, I used to play an instrument years ago, and I don't know what an ostinato is either. (laughs) But four notes seems a bit extreme. I mean, they don't have ownership on all the notes on the planet, and I've got to imagine four notes have been put together somewhere sometime, so... That sounds a little heavy-handed. Yeah, and to $2.8 million for four notes. I mean, that's like a lot of money for notes. That's like less... Well, almost a million dollars per note, right? So, and isn't there yeah. supposed to be a percentage that is copied out of the entire song in order for it to be infringement? Well, that's a really great point. I didn't actually read the case itself, but 2.8 on a very popular song could be the result of a royalty, which is what you're saying. She may have had a, a royalty of 5% awarded against her, 
and that could add up to $2.8 million, depending on how well the song did financially. So it's possible that that's how they got to the number. Yeah, yeah. How about the percentage of content per the entire song? Are there rules with that? Because I thought there were. It's interesting. Damages in copyright cases, they can really be based on a lot of different factors. And usually each side will have an expert that testifies about how much the damages should be. And so you could calculate it on any way that makes sense. Lots of but, times copyright infringement comes down to more than four notes. So, you know, maybe a good expert argument could be made. On the other side, that is such a small piece, it's really not worth the full 5%. I, I think the question is, though, how much can you copy without getting in trouble? Right? Is that what you're trying kind to of. ask? Yeah. Someone had once said it was like 7 to 10%, anything over that, and you're in trouble. I don't know. It was random numbers. <laughs> yeah, I, you're so, the expert. I'm curious. Sure. <laughs> no, no, but sometimes people say that, and that, that may not be a bad way to think about it. The test for copyright infringement is substantial similarity. And that's really a very subjective standard. You can put that in front of a bunch of different people, and they would all come to a different conclusion. But that's the legal test. Are the music lyrics, are the songs, are the film pieces, are they substantially similar? And people look at it and they say, yes, it is, or no, it's not. And it really just kind of comes down to that. Anyway, Phil, what do you have to say about this? Yeah, you know, I come from a very interesting generation of Gen Z. So <laughs> that right there kind of speaks for itself. You know, the biggest thing that I kind of see when it comes to these things is like anybody getting canceled nowadays, this huge cancel culture that you deal with. And, you know, seeing like really just anything from like 90s hip hop to, you know, movies that I grew up watching. It's like, oh, you know, everybody's kind of against this and that. And like they just want to cancel this. It's honestly crazy. And it can get a little out of hand sometimes for sure. That's really true. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of sanctions that society has, right? So there's the lawsuit part, but then there's yep. also the social part, right, which can play uh, a big role. And so, as I mentioned, you know, Dark Horse people are objecting because of Jeffrey Dahmer, and that can also have consequences. So good point. What about our team here from Vital IV Infusion? So welcome to the show. What do you think about all of this? I think they're taking it to the next level. I think that um, with social media, Twitter, things is almost like a small fire that just explodes with certain topics. So um, some of the outrage is to continue the clout of the topic, not necessarily to just, be, so to just yeah. be so happy. It's just to stay relevant with it. So the people who sued Katy Perry, they were a band called Joyful Noise, mm -hmm. right? And so who's to say that they didn't do this just so they could get some publicity, right? right? I mean, it's kind of like they play the track again. They're like, let me hear the original. <laughs> right. So TJ, what do you think? Yeah. I think it takes away from the artist. I think it's just like if I'm a new up-and-coming artist, I would be freaked out out of my mind if I'm going to be sued for everything I put out. Or I think artists in general should just have this freedom of exploring and doing things without some of these backlashes and things to that extent. Yeah, I mean, do you really think that Katy Perry listened to this song from Joyful Noise and said, I'm going to copy these four notes right. and put it in my new song? <laughs> I mean, that no. just doesn't, you know, you could you could see it if somebody like deliberately copies, but, you know, that doesn't seem like it's likely here. Kenya. I don't know. I feel very differently than everybody else in the room. I, I, did, I think working in this business, I think the whole AI situation that's happening now where people can borrow people's voices. And I, and I do think there's certain circumstances where people do listen to certain songs and they're inspired and they're like, oh, I'll just borrow those few notes and, and no one will pay attention. What I think is impressive about her legal team or whoever's legal team this was that sued her is they were able to prove their case. I think it's great that she, or rather the people who were suing her were able to protect their intellectual property and their creativity. I also think I feel the way, same way about my voice. Like if I hear my voice somewhere, according to AI rules now, like I can't even protect my voice. I hear songs all the time by Drake that are remade using his likeness in his voice. It's like there's no protection in that space when it comes to the use of your voice, but there's protection when it comes to musical notes. So it's kind of a little bit of a disparity in the world of creativity. And I'm just wondering, I don't know how that's going to be navigated in the future and like how you as a media person or something like that can be protected in terms of people using your voice or likeness. You know, that's a really good point because back in the 1800s when people wrote symphonies or they did folk music there wasn't as much dissemination of the music as there is now now on the internet anybody can create anything really really fast and it gets out there really really fast mm -hmm. 
And it's really hard to keep up with because even if you're well-meaning, it's hard to keep it straight. What you heard versus what you're doing now, I would imagine for a lot of musicians, that's kind of a challenge. And there's just so many sources out there that didn't used to exist. Yeah. And so how do you keep up with all that? And now you've got AI in, on top of it. Makes uh, it even trickier. I'll say one more thing, too, about that song. So that song was also remade for fitness class use. So I teach cycling, and that has been in some of the playlists that I've seen. So not only did Katy Perry make money off of the original use of it or creativity of it, but she also made use of it in other places with these other companies that are doing remakes of it. So I don't know. I'm for the people if they were able to prove their case and she did borrow it. I also have some discernment in my spirit about that song. So it's interesting to hear that it was about Jeffrey Dahmer because when I listen, I'm like, it sounds pretty dark. So now that I hear that it's about him, I'm like, that makes perfect sense. Definitely is dark. I mean, it's called Dark Horse, yeah. right? So, <laughs> I'm like, oh, what it's do you definitely expect? dark. Anyway, I guess the moral of the story is if you become rich and famous, you can be sued multiple times for just about anything. And I guess that just kind of goes with the territory, right? But we have here a famous actress. We're very delighted. Start getting ready to be sued. (laughs) (laughs) I can defend you. I promise to defend you. So anyway, Sonia Satra has been a TV actress on Guiding Light and One Life to Live. And we all know those names. And now she's also a fitness thought leader and author. She has a new book out that's called What If It Were Easy? That's a great question to ask. What if it were easy? Easy. And so tell us a little bit about the book. I know that you have a special term that you're using for it called modicize. Did I say that correctly? You did. That was all, good. All right. And so tell us about modicizing and your book. Modicize is really a hybrid of coaching and exercise. And it's Gosh, it's had a bit of an evolution from my acting days all the way to the original time I came up with it was At the gym, I was on a treadmill and I was just running. And, you know, they've got the big giant TVs playing lots of news and negative stories. And I was like, wow, this doesn't seem like a great thing to be doing while I'm working out. It's really bringing me down. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to just have a vision board or to be doing something to use all these mindset tools that I had used in the past? I knew they were effective, but I wasn't necessarily doing all of the time. And that was the beginning of Wouldn't it be cool if I could just be efficient and effective? I was a new mom, you know, looking to save time. I could do exercise and mindset all at the same time. And that was really the day I came up with Modicize. Originally, motivational exercise. Now I really look at it more as manifestation through movement because it's quite amazing the things that come up uh, for people during classes and even right after classes or coaching sessions. I think there's really something to this. In fact, full disclosure here, we were talking before the show. I already signed up for a session. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm going to walk while we do it. And I do think that it is important when you're moving, especially, I've heard this from different sources, what goes into your brain while you're moving? Well, there's a lot that happens in your brain and your body. People often refer to the endorphins, right? We know all those good feeling chemicals, the adrenaline, the serotonin, the dopamine, all those feel good things. But there's also, we now know, growth that happens. So something called BDNF is released and that creates new brain cells. So there's actually a whole new growth process happening. And when you connect it to emotion, you can actually create new neural pathways. Thoughts are like paths, right? If you're on a path and the one that most people walk is going to be tramped down. But if you're trying to start something new, create new habits, you know, it's a little more like bushwhacking. So we need to (laughs) tramp down that one. So that becomes the new neural pathway. And that's a lot of what's happening in this movement because your brain is open. It's more creative. It's more focused. You can make better decisions. It taps the motivation center of your brain. So all of this is happening. And it's also more susceptible because it's quite open to what's coming in. So it is a good time to really think about things or to focus on something that's more positive as opposed to being bombarded with negative thoughts. I do wholeheartedly feel like when you're doing movement, whatever you're thinking about or doing goes deeper into your brain. Like I've heard that so many times. And I have to say, I was a good student in school and I got pretty good grades, but I would take notes with my hand during every class, like copious amounts of notes. And that really helped me learn the material. There's a lot of science behind that, taking notes. And I do think there is something about the physicality of it. 
And, you know, we really are designed to move. And therefore, every system in our body has a reward system for it. And so that's part of your brain, your nervous system. It locks in muscle memory and thoughts. And and so we want to try to shift and lock in positive thoughts and nervous system things. Your immune system is up. It's huge for mental health. I mean, the studies around walking or exercising to depression, there are some countries, even New Zealand and Australia, who go so far as to say that you might be depressed because you're not moving. (laughs) And they will make exercise be the first line of defense before they'll hand out medication. So I'm not suggesting, I'm not a doctor, you should get off medication if you're on it. Just if you do struggle with anxiety or depression, definitely adding movement will help. So we have time for one more question before we go to break, but I know Kenya's got to have a comment here. Yeah, I was just curious, what is the content like? And like, do you have you always had a fitness background? So I would say I started mindset first. I always worked out. I was very active in fitness, but once I came up with this idea, I you know got all the certifications for the fitness and combined the two. But I think it was driven by the mindset first because I was really looking at this to propel my mindset and to help achieve goals. Our special guest, Sonia Satra, who is talking about Moda Size, and she's got a brand new book, What If It Were Easy? Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. We'll be right back after this. I'm Richard Gerhardt, founder of Gerhardt Law. We specialize in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. You can find out more at learnmoreabouttrademarks.com. We love working with entrepreneurs and helping their businesses grow. And here is our client, Ricky, to tell it like it is. Hi, I'm Ricky Frango, founder and CEO of Prime 6. We manufacture high-performing, clean, and sustainable fuels like charcoal and logs. We've been working with Gearheart Law since the beginning, really, and they've helped us figure out the trademarks, the patents, everything that has to do with product development and how to protect our inventions. And we're extremely grateful for the wonderful team that has been supporting our business since day one. Thank you, Ricky. To learn more about trademarks, Go to learnmoreabouttrademarks.com and download our free Entrepreneur's Guide to Trademarks or book a free consultation with me to discuss your patent and trademark needs. That's learnmoreabouttrademarks.com for your free booklet about trademarks and a free consultation. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Our special guest, Sonia Satra, who is talking about Moda Size, and she's got a brand new book, What If It Were Easy? What If It Were Easy is really teaching the concept of Moda Size. So it's telling people, it, it guides them through that step-by-step process. And in the book, I do what I call a Modi Minute. So it's one exercise with one mindset, just to give people a taste of what that's like. And there are videos, so you can QR code to the actual live video and try it out. <laughs> um, so it takes you through that step-by-step process around a goal. And it's any goal. It doesn't have to be a fitness goal. It's a lot of people use it for business, for relationships. And then the second half of the book is kind of the superpowers that you need to achieve a goal. So things like courage or persistence or patience or maybe a little daring. That also has a Modi Minute and also lots of coaching and tips and tricks on how you can achieve that. So is that like a visualization where you're visualizing yourself or are you repeating phrases that are optimized for improving what you want to improve? So it's really a combination of all of them. So I always look at it as three major tools that are in here. So the first is visualization, which is super powerful. So really visualizing yourself achieving the goal. We do the old be, do, have, right? Step into what does that look like? What does it feel like? Allow yourself to dream because so often that's hard for people. It's like you put on the the brakes before you even get started. And so it's just a process. That's also where what if it were easy started to come, but I can circle back to that. So we open that up and you visualize what that feels like then we step back into what do you have it's one of my favorite questions because I find when you have a challenge or a goal or something that feels hard people always look at all of the things they don't have right all of the challenges I don't have time I don't have money I don't have this I don't have that I'm not good enough all of that stuff and then we'll go to what do you need what's stopping you we'll burn a little of that then we'll look at action steps and we'll visualize ourselves taking those action steps that is so powerful because we don't know what we have we don't and we don't know what we know that other people maybe want to know 
<laughs> I mean, right, right. What? Right. Exactly. Could you repeat that? I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I was, no, I was at a meeting and I mentioned this show and somebody asked me, I want to pick your brain on how to start a podcast. I was like, well, I'm not sure I'm the expert. And someone said, are you kidding me? <laughs> right. You do yeah. too, but you, you know a lot. Right. Yeah. right. So I'm giving a presentation on it at the same meeting and I didn't even know I knew that. Right. So I think that's really powerful what you're doing. Yeah. It's so that's the one question I think people totally jump over and it changes everything because we'll go to try to come up with action items from a place of lack of feeling like I'm not quite there. I don't have what I need. I'm not in the position or I'm not good enough or I don't know anything. Right. When you know a ton of things. So when you actually look at what you know, it opens up the world. And it will open up ideas, it opens up energy, it opens up a lot. And so that's a really important part of the process. So it's using questions like those. Questions are great because our brains are sort of like Google. It will answer pretty much what we ask. So if we ask, why am I not getting anything done? Or why do I suck at this? You know, it will answer. It's going to go through the recesses of your brain and figure it out for you. But if you ask, how can I do this? Or what's one thing that I can do to make this happen? Then all of a sudden, it starts finding those answers too. So the powerful questions, the visualization, and then we do some affirmations too, which I like to put to boxing because I love boxing. <laughs> so, Sonia, I have a question. Like, when I work out occasionally, uh, my mind wanders, right? And so I'm not sure I can stay focused while I'm working out, especially if there's music or some. I'm trying to count sit-ups or whatever. How do you handle those situations? That's why it helps to have somebody guide you. It really makes a difference. So whether it's a class situation or a one-on-one situation, it really does. Because our minds naturally wander. It's what they do. And so this is just helping to pull it back. Once you get used to the process and you know it really well, it's easier to slip into. People, clients I've had who've done it for a long time, they know it. They go right into it. But in the beginning, it does help to have somebody guide you. And to pull out those pieces, too, because sometimes you'll be asked, what do you have? And you're like, uh, mm, uh, <laughs> you know, right? And I'm like, I know you've got something. <laughs> so the name of the book is What If It Were Easy? And how did you come up with the title? So just as I had become a coach, my husband was a television producer, and he had what they call a first look deal. And so he was basically paid for ideas. And we were living here, and the company that had hired him called him back to L.A., and we figured it was a formality. He was going to go sign the next deal. We just had a baby. So we went to L.A. to sign this new contract. I'm sitting at the bottom of a parking garage in Sunset Boulevard with the baby sleeping, and he comes out. Out and he's white. I was like, what happened? He's like, I was fired. <laughs> I'm like, mm. oh, no. I can't. It was just unimaginable that that was going to happen. He's just like, what are we going to do? We just had a new baby. We got this in New York. We got blah, 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 blah. It's impossible. And we started brainstorming from a place of lack of like, oh, my gosh, panic, not a good resourceful place. You could do this or this or this. And he's like, no, I can't. It's impossible. And he had this idea that a million dollars somehow was going to set him free. And so he was like, it's impossible to earn a million dollars in this business. And I was like, well, somebody's done it. So it's not impossible. And he's like, no, it's impossible. This is a disaster. What are we going to do? And my new coaching brain was like, uh, well, what if it were easy? And he just looked at me like, you know, it's not easy. You know, you're in this business. And I was like, but what if it were easy? What would you do? And then he kind of stopped. He's like, well, if it were easy, I'd start my own company. And that had not been any of the things on our brainstorming list. And I was like, really? So then we started to figure that out. Next day, he started a company. One year later, he made a million dollars. What a great story. I so, love that. That's amazing. What if it were easy? You just don't know. It opens up. It gives you permission to really go for what you want. I love that because I guess when I was first saw the title, I thought, well, we're going to make all of these things easy for you. But it's really a mindset. It's, mm-hmm. it's really a way of looking at things and removing barriers to yes. where you want to go and what you want to be. It's Absolutely. so true. So in terms of like the transformation process of like the people and the folks that you work with through your program, what has that been like? And is there like any case studies 
you can share on like what successes look like for some of the folks that you've worked with? Sure. So I, I actually do work with a lot of entrepreneurs. I love working with entrepreneurs because I think everything impacts. It's a lifestyle, really, right? So everything, your health, your relationships, your work. And so I think they gravitate very much to this kind of a process, knowing that everything impacts everything. And within that, well, one, my husband did become one of my first best clients, and he ended up selling his company for eight figures, and he does Modicize every day. Um, But I've also had other clients come up with brand new business ideas, other brand new business strategies that they've implemented that has made them easily six figures. I've had people, I was telling you, even that's when it started with the manifestation. Somebody walked out of a conference where I was doing modus size and they were like, I got a client five minutes after I left. I can't believe it. You know? (laughs) And so increase of clients. And then on the other side, I've had people on health things. I, I had a client who lost 300 pounds. That was a lot. Start businesses also deal with chronic illnesses and overcome some of the things that stop them in that and pursue what they really wanted. Fall in love, find love, fix relationships, fix family relationships. So that's great. Yeah, there's kind of been a lot, actually. And and I really love how you're doing two positive things at once, right? You're exercising your body and exercising your mind, right? And exactly. Normally we just do one at a time, right? So it seems like it's super efficient. How long does a a workout typically take? I think a sweet spot is somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour. It depends a little on what you're doing, too. If you're doing a a cardio or a spin or something like that, an hour is probably sufficient. If you're walking, sometimes you can go a little more. It's amazing, though. This was a byproduct I didn't expect was people who don't like exercise actually come and say they like it because they're not thinking about reps or how much longer they have to do it. They're thinking about something that they really love. So the mindset is feeding the body. The body is feeding the mind. And it really energizes you in a kind of unexpected but very excellent way. I agree with what you're saying in that in the past I've worked with trainers and part of their tricks are to talk to you while you're working out. So you're not actually thinking about what you're doing. You're listening to them Uh and all of a sudden you're done with the set and you're like, well, that went fast, right? Whereas if you're struggling through it yourself, it's a whole different story. Exactly. Like, oh, another, you know, (laughs) and that's exactly. And I always say you feel what you focus on. Right. So if you're focusing on how much you hate lifting or how many more reps you have, you're going to feel more tired. There's a great study actually with cyclists. I love this one. Uh, It was they took uh, pro cyclists and they had them cycle to capacity and then they had them come back. They rested, came back and did it again. Only this time they did positive self-talk and affirmations and they went 18 percent further Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. much. That's a lot. That's a significant amount just by shifting your mindset. Yeah, you move your mind, you move your life. Because it does tap some of the motivation center and because you start to get in true alignment, things do tend to happen faster. Does that mean it's a straight line to nirvana? Probably not, (laughs) right? We all have our, our little obstacles, but I find that the obstacles become shorter and you get through them much, much faster and much easier. So do people typically continue working with you for a long time because they're finding new stuff all the time? I I do, actually, yeah. Our special guest, Sonia Satra, who is talking about Moda Size, and she's got a brand new book, What If It Were Easy? Where can people find your book, and where can they find out more about Moda Sizing? SoniaSatra.com. If you want to get the book, you could go to WhatIfItWereEasy.com. It's also available at bookstores, and I'm also on social media. That's great. Well, thanks for joining us. We'll be back with more Passage to Profit right after this. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later, and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world. QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. 
Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. It's on to Kenya Gibson. Time for Power Move, Kenya. For Power Move this week, we are going to be talking about Marcus Smith. So Marcus is an NFL veteran. He is a mental health advocate. He's a father, and he is a man of faith. And he was recently on my Power Move podcast talking about his journey through football and athletes and how they deal with all the inner struggles of mental health. Um, talked about some of the experiences that some of them have with suicide and it was just really a great awareness episode about his story and how he's helping athletes really push through to the other side of their full potential and, and healing. So you can check out his full story on my Power Move podcast. And you definitely should do that. Where can we find your Power Move podcast? So it's basically where you can uh, listen to most of your podcasts. Um, you can check it out on Spotify. You can also go to my Instagram page, which is Coach Kenya, and there is a link in my bio there if you want to check it out. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth? Yes. So for those of you who haven't heard this before, <laughs> say, it, say it every time, uh, I have a few different things I'm working on. One of them is the Jersey Pod Cats, and it's a podcast about cats <laughs> with Danielle Woolley. And it started because we had a cat that had this condition. It was scratching himself. We couldn't figure out how to help him. And we thought if we started a community, people would give us ideas. Danielle Woolley is fabulous on this podcast with me. She's hilarious. We're really having a good time. We interview people and we download it once a week. And uh, we've just gotten really cool people on there that love talking about cats and other things too. So the Jersey Pod Cats. And then I have Blue Streak Directory, which is a video directory of professionals, B2B professionals online. I'm waiting on the website now. And I was kind of like, what am I going to do with this? And then I met Sonia. <laughs> And she was like, I'm going to help you with this. So we are going to meet next week and we're going to think about this. And Passage to Profit, I'm working with some of our sponsors to see what we can do with this and um, see how they want to be involved. And, you know, I just love doing this show. I learn. Every single week I learn at least one new thing, usually more. And I feel like I'm at the cutting edge of the world today because of the people that we have on the show. So. That's me. That's right. And and, so, and if you want to be on the show or if you want your brand represented on the show, please contact us at the passage to profit show dot com. So on to our next guest, Phil Toussaint with Ecopreneur, Ecopreneurmedia dot com. And I went to his website. This is very cool. Phil, please tell us what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. So we are a volunteer platform and we work with students in schools across the country to help them really just get their community service hours done and, you know, really kind of going back to your point, Sonia, of, you know, motorizing, really just getting them outside of the classroom and, and getting involved and, and learning and doing those types of things. So it's really, really fun. And it has a positive impact. It does. So what kind of projects are they getting involved in? So there's over 50 different categories that we have on our platform. So it really ranges from tree planting to beach cleanups to city cleanups, you know, whatever that may be specifically. And really just those students can get involved and really just be a part of those projects and fulfill those hours, get those kind of things done and feel good for doing so. The cool thing about our platform, though, is that you get rewarded for doing so. We give out points to these students um, every time that they're volunteering for every hour. And then they can redeem that towards a marketplace that we've built into our tech. So it's really, really interesting. That's great. What motivated you to start this project? It really kind of goes back to... The, when I was in college, I went on an Everglades field trip project. I never camped in my life. I had to camp for 10 days down there straight up in the you know middle of it. And I was like, man, this is crazy. Like, uh, you know, it was just a surreal experience for me. But it opened me up to a lot of the climate change kind of like effects that they were dealing with as well as different kinds of crazy things that I saw firsthand. And it opened my mind and I was like, I really want to get involved in this work. I want to be a part of the action that's going to be behind changing our world and making it better. And that's kind of like where it all started. At that point, I kind of moved forward with it, um, started it off really as a YouTube channel we were doing at the time. Um, and at that point, it was just educating people about, you know, sustainability, getting involved, uh, learning about different problems and things that they're really kind of like removed from it at the end of the day. Um, and then at that point, it was really kind of the pandemic hit. Crazy time for everybody. And it forced us to kind of pivot. And we wanted to really just listen to our audience, see what people wanted. And people wanted volunteering. So we gave that. 
That's really great because everybody wants to do something, right? Absolutely. Especially young people who maybe have a little time. They're looking for a community to be a part of a yes. positive community. Absolutely. So this is a great opportunity for them to get involved and meet other people and put something on their resume. Exactly, yeah. And the really cool thing about it is that it goes beyond the classroom, as I mentioned. There's service learning that comes with that. And you see an uptick with you know students just performing in the classroom because of the fact that they're getting that exposure and just being able to go and learn and do different things, which is really, really cool. There's also just a lot of studies behind students being able to outperform other students just based off of doing this work. Even college students that want to get involved and they're looking to get a position outside of school and really get into the real world. We've seen that, you know, just being part of these things and doing this work allows you to excel and stand out amongst your peers. So So how does the process work? So there are two sides to your website, right? Yes. The people that want volunteers and the people that want to volunteer. Exactly. So let's say I'm looking for somebody to clean up my town. Yep. I go to your website? You go to my website. So you would go on to ecopreneurmedia.com. You can sign up. Whether you're a municipality or an NGO, you can go on, pretty much make a profile, and it's as simple as kind of an eventbrite where you could just throw up a project and really they're just kind of like a landing page that would be created for your project. From there, uh, volunteers, we work with the schools directly. So high schools, colleges, universities across the U.S., that are looking to get their students involved and things like that. They would just go ahead, make a profile, and then from there, those students can get involved and and start signing up for those projects. It's as simple as that. Great idea. Thank you. Kenya, how are you monetizing the platform? So we charge schools a flat yearly rate, a subscription to be a part of our platform. And then like the other end user who's like the student, like how does that work when they come onto the platform? Do they pay? So no, the student doesn't pay. Uh Um, It's all part of the package kind of subscription that the school's paying for, essentially for their students to get access to that. Nice. Um, So it really allows for the students to just make a profile, go ahead and get involved and get started. What's really cool is we're building also the technology. We just got an investor, so it's been really exciting for us to kind of like ramp things up as we have the base platform. But now we're kind of building the school portal essentially for the students and the schools to be a part of. Mm -hmm. What's really cool about that is it's going to allow for um, groups to be created and athletic directors and things like that to get involved and really be hands-on with their students and especially athletes as well. Um, that are looking to fulfill those hours and build their resumes and things. So, yeah. Wow, that's great. Absolutely. It's been so exciting. We've started partnerships this year. So we've had a bunch of municipalities in Massachusetts, New Jersey is where we kind of started off and we started to build our team over the summer. We also have the YMCA, Salvation Army. We've worked with Camden, New Jersey. It's been really exciting to have a lot of different municipalities and NGOs you know, starting to be a part of the platform and expanding with us. What we're doing right now at the moment is really because of the new investor that we had just you know, gotten, Uh, We're going to be building the school portal more in depth and also um, just more kind of features for the municipalities for them to be able to get the help that they need. What's really interesting down the road is we kind of see it as a more the billion dollar platform kind of like goal is to involve brands. And that's where they kind of become a part of the marketplace. They can give up rewards that students can earn through the points that they get on our platform. We have a, a really cool term that we coin it called incentivized activism, essentially allowing for people to do good but get incentivized for it. So it's a, you know, rewarding good behavior, essentially. That's excellent. So I'm assuming that this is going on a lot of college applications. Absolutely. That's the biggest thing, too. It's allowing for those kids to build essentially a service resume Mm -hmm. and allowing for them to be able to then showcase that and say, hey, this is what I've done. This is the work that I've helped in local communities, really collective local impact. The next six months for us is really just going to be to be able to not only build the platform, but make sure we get the right word out. For example, we're looking at National Honor Society as like an organization we want to work with to be able to say, we know you guys have millions of students across the U.S. We want to be able to service to them and give them this platform essentially to be able to utilize it. Really just making sure that the team is core and, and perfect as can be um, for us to be able to execute accordingly. So Most entrepreneurial ventures have some sort of team. What kind of positions do you have and how do you attract team members to be part of your team? The biggest thing that we say with Ecopreneur is you work for the mission, not the company. And that's extremely important when you're building a company. You want to make sure that you're kind of essentially getting people on the mission and what we're trying to do and the good that we're doing. Um, The really cool thing about that is people believe in that mission and they want to be a part of that and they want to help grow it. And that's where we've started to see that alignment overall. So when it comes to, you know, myself, my co-founder, who's the COO, and we also have a design team, we have a marketing team, sales team, development team, and they're all kind of based in different areas. One cool thing is we've adapted. 
So in the times that we live in now, you know, there's a lot of remote teams, especially kind of hybrid and things like that, right? So we've taken that into account and we're like, you know, we have our developers, some of them in Lithuania that are going to be meeting with us in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have, you know, somebody down in Dallas, Texas. We have people out in California. So we're really kind of spreading out and, and just trying to like kind of really build our team abroad and, and really, uh, you know, taking that into account as we're growing. So. So one of the things that you're talking about is the website. That seems yes. to be like sort of the linchpin of mm -hmm. the organization. How did you find somebody that you had confidence in and wanted to hire to kind of hand over yeah. the whole thing to them, right? Yeah. So. so I went through probably three to four different developers just to find that person. And it was actually a connection through my girlfriend, which was kind of funny. Um, she was the one that introduced me to the developers that are on my team now because she was building a platform herself that was oriented around babysitting. From there, we were able to then kind of like pick their brain, do some testing, and then it just worked out. When it comes to our platform, there's kind of a three-sided marketplace, essentially, of municipalities and NGOs, schools and students, and then as well as, in the future, the brands. Um, the brands that can come on and essentially sponsor and be a part of this, allowing for that tangible kind of impact, which is really exciting. It all intricately works because we did a lot of that research and outreach, essentially. Great. Yeah. So where do people go to find this? Absolutely. So we're all over social media, Ecopreneur Media. Um, you'll find myself, Ecopreneur Phil, as well on there. Um, and then we also have our website, ecopreneurmedia.com. So if you guys have any questions or want to reach out, if you want to be a part of this in any way, uh, shape or form, I'm, I'm excited to chat with you. So, Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Phil Toussaint. Thanks that so was excellent. Now we are on to our final presenters, and we have Mamie Bio, and we have TJ Shaw with Vital IV Infusion. I will say it's in our hometown of Chatham, New Jersey. It's an amazing business. Tell everybody what you guys are doing, please. So we have an infusion clinic in Chatham, New Jersey. So it's where holistic meets medicine. So it's a, basically a wellness clinic that we have. We do IV hydrations, hangover remedies, IV vitamins, NAD, ketamine, and we do weight loss. So an array of different products we have at the clinic. So there are a lot of hangover people. In I was just going to Hangovers? Yeah. Does it work? It does. <laughs> you feel like a million bucks. <laughs> well, now we know. <laughs> So, TJ, you were actually giving these infusions at an event at the Mall at Short Hills, but in a co-working space. People were actually coming in, and I got a vitamin infusion when I was there, mm -hmm. and I did feel better. All the vitamins and supplements we take via the stores, et cetera, they don't really readily get absorbed in our GI system. So, say you take a B-complex pill in the morning, you're probably going to get 40% of that at best. The only thing you may get a higher percentage is vitamin C, maybe get 60%. But when we infuse it through the IV, you're bypassing all that acid in your stomach and you're getting 100% of everything that vitamin should be doing. So that instant aspect of the IV and the benefits from the vitamin is why you feel great quickly and last a little bit longer. So you're really sticking needles in people, right? Yep. So it, this is intravenous, like when you're in the hospital, right? And you have a bag hanging over you, and then there's this tube. And yep, you... we insert a needle in the vein, and then we administer all the, either the IV vitamins, our NAD therapy, or our weight loss stuff, or even our ketamine goes straight through the can we intravenous. Talk, yeah. Can we talk about the ketamine a little bit? I don't sure. know which one of you would like to talk about it, but... It's recently been legalized, right? Like in the last couple of years? Yeah. Ketamine's been utilized since the 60s and 70s, but in hospital settings for IV anesthesia. Just recently, in the last four to five years, FDA approved intranasal therapy for treatment-resistant depression and suicidal ideation. IV therapy has been off-label use for those aspects for about 10 years or so now. It's gaining popularity now. We have um, IV vitamin therapy, so we do a multitude of IV vitamins. So we have vitamin C, different forms of B vitamins. We also do different forms of magnesium therapy. And then for our athletes and just in general, we do a lot of amino acid therapy as well. We do a combination and curate to the person's needs. That's sort of our greatest thing is yeah. I think we make it more of a subjective thing to the person. And instead of it just being like you pick off the menu, which you can do, but we sort of like to mix and match things for the person and their lifestyle and their age, everything to that extent. Our most popular drip is the Myers cocktail that has a broad range of 
IV vitamins. And sometimes people come in if they lack energy, you just feel like burnt out or maybe you come from um, working out extensively or you come from traveling. So a lot of people will Google or look up like IV hydration to basically replenish yourself. NAD is a new thing also that's been pretty popular. Sometimes you'll even hear about it with the Kardashians. What is NAD? So NAD is a natural coenzyme that we have in our bodies, but it gets depleted over time from just an aging process, working out too extensively, not working out enough, not getting enough sunlight. Sometimes when you're fatigued, it boosts your metabolism. So like the first day is like a detox. You might feel fatigued the first day, then you get that burst of energy afterwards. Well, I could use yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is all natural. And it does help with mild anxiety, mild depression, because it naturally increases your serotonin levels. What are the, I guess, long-term benefits of going on a program with you versus, you know, people taking like psychotropic drugs or things like that to stay in a good place mentally? For us with the ketamine, it's more of a control thing. Mm -hmm. So when I administer an IV, and to that extent, I know the exact dosage I'm giving you. Whereas with the psychotropic stuff, the studies are great, but there's no dosing. They're still studying everything. Um, As far as IV, I know how much systemically got absorbed, and then we can maintain. So after a person finishes a series with us, we keep them on a chronic maintenance aspect as well, in addition to everything they're doing. But it's for that aspect of things. And the ketamine is a little different than the psilocybin or MDMA in terms of just the receptors that it works on. So it works a little differently than those aspects. Mm -hmm. I I can say I I know several people who have done it, including some some people who are very close to me. And the results were really incredible. And they had tried a lot. Uh, One person I know had, had been depressed his whole life and He did a whole series, and he's like, it's a miracle. I I am really a changed person. So I think the integration process after is also important, but uh, I I just i am a big believer of it. I've seen the results firsthand numerous times. I will add to that. So I had a family member suffering through postpartum that led to major depression, even suicide ideation. So on the other end, sometimes they feel helpless, you feel hopeless in helping them. And sometimes the pill form is just not enough or it has side effects of weight gain and mm-hmm. different things that turned you off from even maintaining consistency with it. So that was part of why we started it. And me and TJ and our other partner, we were in the front line during COVID with the ICUs and everything. So we give ketamine as an anesthetic you know, during surgeries. So seeing afterwards, that helped a lot. So in terms of like the affordability factor, like, because obviously the more consistent you are with something like this, the better the results are going to be. How do people who may have a misconception that this is not affordable for them fit into what you have to offer? In terms of the ketamine therapy, insurance companies have been more and more open to reimbursement. So when we first opened a year and a half ago to two years ago, people were getting about 15% reimbursement as far as their whole series. And now from our patients, we've had about almost 60% reimbursement. And some have even been fully reimbursed, but it's so subjective to the insurance company. I think our pricing, our first meeting when we opened was like, it has to be accessible. Like Mm -hmm. that's our biggest thing. And if you can't come to us, there's no point of us even considering right. wellness because how can someone afford a thousand dollar infusion so we try to be the most accessible and infusion. i think even in our communities and i'll make this point really quick like in communities of color especially yeah. it doesn't seem affordable and it's no. not really part of our culture and like one of the things that i've been working on is just making sure that we're creating accessibility yeah. right when it comes to mental health resources so i love that yeah. you have that mindset and our biggest thing is that and education mm-hmm. and i think a lot of it's knowing because like In our communities, a lot of it's the unknown. Like, they don't know why they feel a certain way. They don't know why they're waking up angry or why they're leaning towards alcoholism or drugs or whatever it may be. It's a level of understanding. What are your plans for expansion? Because I think that this could help a lot of people in a lot of places. We're ready. We're getting there. We have the office fully staffed now. It's running on its own with our ability to do consults like remotely and still in office. We're ready to expand. We're looking to franchising. We're looking into all those aspects of things and opening different clinics in different areas. We've advised a few people already. One of our patients, he was a former vet. He actually just opened his clinic in Tampa and we assisted and consulted them through the whole process and they're up and running and they're working with vets hand in hand. 
mental health and even hydration or taking vitamins is such a taboo. And sometimes it's a lot of education and we do want broad accessibility. So that's also why we offer the IV ketamine. We also are now accredited for the vets because they've been on the front line and then they come back to civilian life and need help. But also for those who don't have the resources for IV ketamine, we also have Spravato, which is covered through insurance, um, Medicaid, Medicare. So we offer help broadly and we just want as much outreach as we can. Mamie Bio and TJ Shaw with the Vital IV Infusion. And you can find them at vitalivinfusion.com. They have a nice facility in Chatham. I think it's a really good setup they have. And you are listening to Passage to Profit, The Road to Entrepreneurship with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, Kenya Gibson, and our special guest today, Sonia Satra. We will be right back. I'm Richard Gearhart of Gearhart Law. We specialize in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. We love working with entrepreneurs, and here is our client, Anya, to tell you what it's like working with us. Anya? Hi, I'm Anya, the founder of Happy Bond, and we've been with Gerhard Law for about six years. They followed our whole patent and trademark journey, and we're extremely happy that we had them at our side, especially because our product is a pet collagen that has now two patents, thanks to them, for the joint of the pets and a new dog food that is extremely new and has a process that is protected through their help. We really have to thank them for guiding us through the whole process and as a startup made it possible for us to do that. Thank you, Anya. So to learn more about patents, go to learnmoreaboutpatents.com and download our free Entrepreneur's Guide to Patents. That's learnmoreaboutpatents.com. It's Passage to Profit. Now it's time for Noah's Retrospective. Noah Fleischman is our producer here at Passage to Profit, and he just has a way of putting his best memories in perspective. Can you imagine a world without caller ID? That was the world I grew up in. Either you sat by the phone all day and waited for it to ring and pounced when it did, or you stayed out of the house all day to avoid the call you didn't want. Well, one day my mother got nailed. It was about 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. My mother and I had just moved into our brand new apartment, and nobody was awake. The phone woke us up. Who could it be? My mother picked up, and turns out it was her old friend from high school 30 years earlier. She hadn't spoken to this woman in years, but she calls up and says, Hey, I got your number from a friend, and I'm in town. You want to get together? Well, my mom's just kind of waking up. Her hair's a mess, and she's in her night clothes, and she says to her, Oh, you know, I would love to, but it turns out I have plans today, and I was just on my way out the door. Well, they parted kindly and hung up, and I broke up into an explosion of laughter. My mother didn't know what hit me. I explained to her what I was laughing at, the sight of her in her bedclothes with her hair a mess, saying I was just on my way out the door, and we both laughed together for at least a good five minutes. It was a wonderful mother and son bonding moment, and it was made possible by a little less technology. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth, Passage to Profit. What a great show. I really had an absolutely yeah, fantastic are we do time. Yeah, we going to the group question? And I think we should do the group question. Okay, so I have But a... I can still say we had a great show. Oh, we're still having a great show. We still are. <laughs> and if you want to hear the whole show from the beginning, if you're just tuning in now, what does our audience do? They go to Passage to Profit Show podcast, wherever they find their podcasts. Excellent. So it will be out tomorrow. So... I am going to start with Sonia Satra. SoniaSatra.com is her website. The question today is, what has had the biggest impact on your business? I think at the end of the day, in both businesses, even as an actress and now with what I do, it is relationship building, genuine relationship building. So taking the time, getting to know people, listening a lot, and uh, being willing to pay things forward or do things, you know, just to help. I think that that at the end of the day, has probably had the greatest impact. Excellent. Very interesting. Yes. Because, you know, today we're all about social media and reaching as many people as we can, but sometimes we forget to actually have real relationships with real people because we mm -hmm. spend so much time trying to connect with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really value the relationships I have. Yeah. Phil Toussaint, EcopreneurMedia.com. What has had the biggest impact on your business? 
I would say kind of similar to Sonia's answer, going back to what I explained earlier of building a team and, and surrounding yourself with the right people. I saw that like once I found the right advisors and mentors and team members to kind of fill the gaps that I was missing in my weaknesses, we were able to 10x just everything that we did. That's probably the biggest thing that has helped Ecopreneur exceed and, and grow now. Absolutely. Yeah. I Very agree. Good. And that's what yeah. investors look for is the team, right? A hundred percent. Mamie Bio and TJ Shaw with Vital IV Infusion, vitalivinfusion.com. What has had the biggest impact on your business? The biggest impact has been outreach and education. Also, with the ketamine aspect of mental health, it's just seeing that process and developing those patient relations. That's excellent. Kenya Gibson, Coach Kenya, our media maven. I would say COVID has had the biggest impact positively and negatively, especially on our business. Our business has changed all the way. Like we do nothing like we used to do it before. Everything is a much more interactive experience. And I will say even personally with the things that I'm working on in the wellness space, it's just given me a different scope and a creative lens and it's like really pushed me past limitations I thought were there. COVID was tough, but it was impactful in that it pushed everybody past what they thought they could or could not do. And if you were able to survive COVID, especially as an entrepreneur and a creative, you have a lot to look forward to. I agree. Richard Gearhart, Gearhart Law, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and great legal advice. Well, thank you. I think all of the new thinking that has been taking place over the years about how people can start their own businesses and become entrepreneurs has really made a huge impact in our business because that's what we do. We support entrepreneurs with intellectual property services. Just the thought that you can start your own thing and be successful and you have the tools and you have the access that you didn't have before has made a huge difference in our business. I agree. I think for me, with the things I'm working on, people are important. They can make or break your business, quite honestly. But the technology, like five years ago when we started this, Hardly anybody was doing podcasts. I mean, luckily we had Kenya to lead us through. <laughs> um, and now everybody's doing them. And I just started another podcast less than a year ago with Danielle Woolley. And there's no way five years ago we could have done that with the tools that were available. Now you have Podmatch. Now you have Buzzsprout. You have Libsyn if you want to do video podcasts. I mean, it's just unbelievable, the technology that allows entrepreneurs to kind of put things together themselves to test it. Yeah. So we have to wrap things up. It's been a great show. Thanks, everybody. And before we go, I'd like to thank the Passage to Profit team, Noah Fleischman, our producer, Alicia Morrissey, our program director. Our podcast can be found tomorrow anywhere you find your podcast. Just look for the Passage to Profit show. And you can find us on Instagram and threads at Passage to Profit show and Twitter, or if you're even more up to date, X at Passage to Profit and on our YouTube channel. Please also join us on our new Facebook group. Search for Passage to Profit Show Listener Community, a new community space for our listeners and guests where you can post questions that you would like answered on the show and interact with the Passage to Profit team. And remember, while the information on this program is believed to be correct, never take a legal step without checking with your legal professional first. Gerhardt Law is here for your patent, trademark, and copyright needs. You can find us at gearheartlaw.com and contact us for a free consultation. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. <laughs>